You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I'm Robert Jackson with the Great Hearts Institute, and we are delighted today to uh, to try a little something that we've never done before on this podcast, uh, namely to take some of the work at the symposium from this past year and bring it to a larger audience. Uh, we, we had our friend Nick Hutchison, who you see here on the screen, uh, an author, uh, actor, director. He's worked with the BBC, ITV, the Globe, Shakespeare Theater. Uh, he's, he seems to be uh, the, the man about town when it comes to the bard and all things uh, uh, of William Shakespeare. He was with us and hosted a workshop for teachers one of whom was Miss Sarah Seal, who you see here uh, in the other the other camera, uh, along with Chase Adelsman, who is they're both teachers and work in uh, in theater there at Nova Classical Academy in the Twin Cities. We're basically going to host a workshop around one of Shakespeare's scenes, one of those most uh, most well known scenes actually from from Hamlet. But I wanted to thank both uh, Nick and uh, Sarah and Chase for joining us today because we're kind of giving this a, a first try. It's literally a dress rehearsal, but it's also going to go live here shortly. So uh, thank you for your willingness to, to be extemporaneous. Uh, and with that, let me turn it over to Nick, our director. Nick. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, what I'm going to <laughs> put my willing victims through, really. Um, those who had heard me talk at the symposium, my, my interest in Shakespeare is, is textual and, and classical. I think we learn a lot from Shakespeare just by really, really close reading it, by not making assumptions about what things mean. It's very easy to think, oh, well, that's what that scene is. Uh, and, and my experience of directing Shakespeare and working at the Globe is very much about really digging into the text to see if what, what we think is being said is what's actually being said. And and, and this scene from, from Hamlet, the, the nunnery scene, the get thee to a nunnery scene in Hamlet, seems to me one that particularly pays um, to actually go into it and really, really examine the moment by moment rather than go, oh, it's a scene about that. So Chase and Sarah are very kindly going to read the scene for me. Um, and then we're going to get back to the top and we'll talk a bit about the scene and then we'll talk about, we'll go through it just bit by bit and really see if that makes a difference because I have a theory about this scene that it's it's something very different to what most people think it is. So Chase and Sarah, can I can I get you just to, it's, it's, it's about a what, four, five, four minute scene. Perhaps you could just read it and then I'll, we'll go back to the top. So this is Hamlet and Ophelia in, obviously, Hamlet. It's off to you now, the fair Ophelia, nymph, in thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good, my lord. How does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. My lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have long and long to re-deliver. I pray you now receive no. them. No, I never gave you up. My honored lord, you know right well you did. And with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Their perfume must take these again. For to the noble mind, rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. There, my lord. <laughs> Uh, are you honest? My lord. Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? Aye, truly. For the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bod than the force of honesty can translate beauty into its likeness. This was some time of paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed me. For virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock, but we shall relish of it. I loved you not. I was the more deceived. Get thee to a nunnery. 
or I wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not born me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape to, or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between heaven and earth? We are errant knaves, all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where is your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow. Thou shall not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery. Go, farewell. Or if thou wilt meet, marry, marry a fool. For wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go, and quickly too. Farewell. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. I've heard of your paintings too well enough. God hath given you one face and you make yourselves another. You jig, you amble, and you lisp and nickname God's creatures and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to, I'll have no more aunt. It hath made me mad. I say we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery. Go. Oh, what a noble mind is here our throne. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the inspectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, that suck the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangling out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Very nice reading. Wow, this is <laughs> this is the danger of working with prose, really. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're all over this, like, like cheap. See, that was excellent. Very good. So in it, it just very briefly you know what what happens in this it, 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 how would you describe the scene i mean how do you feel sarah at the end of that scene dismayed because it seems like for ophelia the hamlet that she knows or that the hamlet that she knew previously is not the hamlet that she's interacting with in this scene and that wondering if she is at least somewhat culpable for this change in Hamlet as she has refused to see him any longer. She isn't accepting his letters. And now in this interaction with him, he seems so markedly changed. I agree. I, I think that's absolutely right. And he's pretty vicious to you towards the end of it, isn't it? I mean, you know, Chase, you were giving it some attack. And I mean, there's, you know, it, it, it's pretty, pretty aggressive. Uh, and, 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 uh, I'm not out of order here, but you know, nunnery is is a notorious euphemism in Shakespeare, and it's a euphemism for a brothel. So what you're saying is, get thee to a brothel. In other words, all women are unfaithful. My mother is unfaithful because she's married Claudius. I'm tiring you with the same brush as all other women, and and it, it's this horrific sort of assault on her. And 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 at the end of it, you know, she has that monologue where she's like, "Wow, what happened there?" Which is great, and 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 that's how it, it it's played. I just get confused about this because at the end of the play, Hamlet leaps into Ophelia's grave. Because he loved her um, more than twenty thousand brothers, forty thousand if you're doing Ophelia. And and you sort of want to go, well, no, you didn't. You told her to go to a brothel and sort of die, really. Uh, and in the very next scene, when after this, when when um, they're about to perform the mouse trap, Hamlet says to Ophelia, hi, and she goes, hi, and he goes, can I sit with you? And she goes, yeah, you can sit with me. And he goes, can I put my head in your lap? And she says, are you talking dirty? And, and they do a bit of flirty, flirty stuff. And if I was her after this scene, I'd go, push off, posh boy, and, and, and you know, go away. You were unmitigatedly hateful to me. So I think it, it's worth breaking it down and, and having a look really closely at it. So Because um, also I think the danger with anything in Shakespeare, and I always feel this, if you think you're doing the something scene, like the nunnery scene, you're probably not getting it right because he's cleverer than that. 
Do you know what I mean? He mixes and matches. So you may be doing the something scene for those few lines, but it might be the something very different scene for something else. And I think I think there's some really interesting stuff in here. And it's, I have to say, it's really nice to do it with people who know how to read Shakespeare, um, because because it makes like, it makes my life so much easier. So I'm so grateful to you for doing this. C can we go again from the top? And this time I'm going to stop you, and we're just going to talk about stuff. And and and. The, the the most important thing is you feel utterly free to disagree with me because that's what I always say to my actors, um, because I have I have a theory about this scene that that you know you need to go along with, but you need to ask questions, uh, and what I always say to students, and I think it's the most important thing to drama students and and, and students at school. I don't really care what the answer to the question is. What I care about is that you know what questions to ask, uh, and 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 it seems to me that that that's the most important thing we can teach is how to question this stuff so let's take it again from the top chase would you and and i'm gonna this time i'm gonna stop you sure thing soft you now the fair ophelia nymph and thy orisons be all my sins remembered good my lord how does your honor for this many a day Okay, so stop there. So things that obsess me in Shakespeare and I love talking about include what people call each other. And so the first thing you call her is the fair Ophelia, the beautiful Ophelia, nymph in thy orisons. So nymph, oh, God, the dog's off. Um, nymph is, well, what's a nymph? A nymph's a water spirit or a wood spirit. And they're primarily known for being sexually attractive. You know, it's where the word nymphomania comes from. Uh, and he calls her thou. In thy orisons be all my, and thou is the personal, like tutoy in French. So he calls her beautiful, sexy, and thou. She calls him, good my lord, how does your honour? You honour my lord. Do you see what I mean? So instantly you've got that they're in a different scene. She, she, He's going, hi gorgeous, how are you? And she's going, good afternoon, sir. It's nice to see you. Um, so... There's a very big difference between what's going on, I think, between the two of them. But the most important question to ask always, again, is, is what are we speaking? Are we speaking verse or prose? And they're speaking verse. Um, and, and she's picking up on his, be all my sins remembered, good my lord. How does your honour for this many a day? So we, we, we start, and it's not surprising. We've just had to be or not to be. So we're in verse. And that's lovely. So we're, we're in a verse scene. So can we go from um, good my lord, how does your honour? Good, my lord. How does your honor for this many a day? I humbly thank you. Well, well, well. <laughs> Beautifully done, Jess. Yeah. And the two extra wells there aren't in the second quarter. This isn't at all in the first quarter, but they're not in the second quarter that published the play, but they are in the folio. So they're a later edition. And it seems to me what it does, I humbly, I mean, you can't make that an iambic pentameter. Well, you can, but you'd sound insane. You know, I humbly thank you well, well, well. No one talks like that. I humbly thank you well, well, well. So there's two extra wells that he's put in seem to me to demetricalize it, if that word exists, which it doesn't. In other words, it breaks the meter and, and it makes it less verse and more prosy. I humbly thank you well, well, well. So Hamlet and Shakespeare are doing something there. So we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's keep going. My Lord, I have remembrances of yours that I have a longed long to redeliver. I pray you now receive them. No. And longed, of course, is that you only do that extended word if you're in verse to try and make the meter work, that I have longed long to redeliver. So it's a, it's a pointer to the audience that Ophelia is speaking verse, I think. And I think she's trying to keep it formal because she knows from her father and Claudius what she's supposed to be doing in this moment and in this scene. She wants to keep that formality, even if he's not going to match her in this moment. I think that's right. But I also think with verse, I mean, and, and I don't know, Sarah, if you were the, the one I did with this, as a general acting rule um, in, in, in Shakespeare, I think you can sort of say that prose tends to come from here. And the iambic goes de dum de dum de dum de dum de dum and comes from there. So I think she is trying to keep it formal, but I think she's also fighting against the fact she doesn't want to keep it formal. Do you see what I mean? So she's still in verse. She's st she's still keeping in a verse scene. And then uh, so let's go from uh, I pray you now receive them. 
Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, she she says, "My lord," you know, she's keeping it polite, and she knows she's being overlooked, of course. I pray you now receive them. No, no, I never gave you aught. My honored lord, you know right well you did, and with them words of so sweet breath composed as made the things more rich. Their perfume lost, take these again, for to the noble mind rich gifts wax poor when givers prove unkind. And that's a rhyming couplet, so you could hardly make it more obvious that you're speaking. Do you mean this is all for the harder thinking in the audience? I think it, it's it's and and indeed the the actor playing the boy playing Ophelia. I'm speaking verse because it rhymes and it rhymes in couplet form. You could hardly make it more obviously verse. Keep going. There, my lord. <laughs> Are you honest, my lord? Are you fair? What means your lordship? That if you be honest and fair, your honesty should admit no discourse to your beauty. Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? So I... we've both gone into prose. Do you sort of mean? So it, it, I, I think my, my take on this, and, and, and it, it, there are loads of different ways of playing this, but would be why has Hamlet prosified the scene? Ophelia was very happy doing the scene in verse, and Hamlet made it prose. And I I think that's telling. And I think, you know, your why is my why might not be the same. But if you don't notice that it's gone from a verse scene to a prose scene, you're missing Shakespeare's, if you'll pardon the pun, most versatile way of, of, of directing the actors, which is prose versus verse. So something's happening about this. Uh, and, and Hamlet's deliberately with that well, well, and constantly pushing it back into prose. And Ophelia was trying to do Roman couplets and she's lost. She, she's into prose too now. Pick it up from uh, Could Beauty, My Lord, would you, Sarah? Could beauty, my lord, have better commerce than with honesty? I truly, for the power of beauty will sooner transform honesty from what it is to a bod, than the force of honesty can translate beauty to, into his likeness. This was sometime a paradox, but now the time gives it proof. I did love you once. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. You should not have believed. Indeed, my lord, you made me believe so. So it's a ten-syllable line. So he says he loved her once, and she goes back into a sort of, it's not metrically regular, but it's a ten-syllable line. She's sort of trying to get it back into verse. You know what I mean? I, I think your comment, Sarah, is right. She's trying to keep it formal, but she keeps having to reconnect with this, the fact that, you know, underneath it she loves him and why is he treating her like this what is he doing um go for him indeed my lord you made me believe so indeed my lord you made me believe so you should not have believed me for virtue cannot so inoculate our old stock but we shall relish of it i loved you not i was the more deceived get thee to a nunnery why wouldst thou be a breeder of sinners? I am myself indifferent, honest, but yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious. So, sorry, sorry, what? sorry. What, sorry, what are you? You're very... I am very proud. What was the next one? Revenge. Yeah. Revengeful. How revengeful is Hamlet? I mean, I would argue that if Hamlet was revengeful, the ghost would come back from the dead, say, kill Claudius. Hamlet would kill Claudius, and we could all be in the bar by 8.45. As it is, we've got four hours of Hamlet dithering about whether or not to kill Claudius. I would argue he's not remotely revengeful. <laughs> How ambitious is he? Well, Denmark is an elective kingship, so even if Claudius gets the throne, Hamlet should have been in the market for the, for the crown, which goes to Claudius. I don't know a moment in the play where Hamlet complains about not being king. You know what I mean? I mean, he complains about the fact that Claudius has married his mother uh, and that Claudius probably shouldn't be king, but it, there's no sort of it should have been me, it should have been me. Proud, well, that's your definition of how you play Hamlet, I think, about whether Hamlet's a proud man or, or not. You know, that's, that's a directory choice. But revengeful seems to me the one that stands out there, you know. It is the least revengeful of any revenge tragedy I can possibly think of. You know, most revenge tragedies are like, how quickly can I kill them? But this one isn't. So what's he, who's he, who's he dissing? 
Who's he being rude about? It seems to yeah. me he's being rude about himself. So, you know, he's, he's, he's going, you know, I'm, I'm very proud, revengeful, ambitious. Um, just go, go from there, would you, again, Chase? I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, with more offenses at my beck than I have thoughts to put them in, imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between heaven and earth? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. In other words, God, men, shockingly bad, and I'm pretty much one of the worst. It just reminds me, and, and I hope neither of you have ever you know, experienced this, but every Dear John letter, as we call them over here, I don't know if that phrase works in the States, but every letter you get when you're being dumped always says, this is not about you, it's about me. And 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 I'm I'm not up for this really. And you 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 the letter just goes. I'm a terrible human being, and you're better off without me, because that makes the whole thing easier. This is just an elaborate, dear John. It seems to me is I'm a terrible, terrible man. Why would you want to breed with sinners? Why would you want to be in any way involved with me? Don't you just don't want to be go 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 to a nunnery? And and it seems to me what he's doing, and and and, and what he's doing in the pro by prosifying the scene. What the is. Is he's <laughs> and, and to Claudius? Um, it, it, it seems to me what he's doing by prosifying the scene is is you can't push your girlfriend away in verse. Do you see what I mean? If, if if you're in connection with your heart and you love someone, you can't push them away. But he has to push her away. Well, why does he have to push her away? You can you can again that that has many different answers. It seems to me. There's a, there's, there's a Chinese proverb, isn't there? When you set out for revenge, first dig two graves. Well, if he knows he's going to kill the king, he knows he's going to die. What you don't want your girlfriend to be is collateral. And in a world where love can't exist, like Elsinore, it seems to me what Hamlet's doing is he's pushing her away. And you can do all you like. And I did some research into this about nunneries and euphemism for brothels. And I can give you lots of examples well i can give you under fewer than 10 examples of where it's definitely being used as a euphemism for a brothel i can give you about a hundred examples of where nunnery is being used as a euphemism for a nunnery what's the safest place to go if you need sanctuary and you're a woman it's a nunnery where is Maid marion when robin hood comes back from the war so at this point i don't think get thee to a nunnery means i hope you die rat bag I think it means get somewhere safe because this is going to turn ugly. And he, he has and he can't tell her what he's going to do because he doesn't want to make her an accomplice. But he's got to try and push her away. I think it's what that farewell scene is that she describes in the previous scene. Um, so, and then there's this great moment coming up here where, where I think it changes completely. Can you take it from, um, go from I'm very proud again, um, Chase, and give it, give it, give, give it full, full actor attack. Yeah. I am very proud, revengeful, ambitious, and with more offenses at my back than I have thoughts to put them in. Imagination to give them shape or time to act them in. What should such fellows as I do crawling between heaven and earth? We are errant knaves all. Believe none of us. Go thy ways to a nunnery. Where is your father? <laughs> Brilliant. 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 It's one of the great anticlimaxes in any speech in Shakespeare, isn't it? Blah, 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 blah. We're crawling between heaven and earth. We're Aaron knaves all believe none of us go thy ways to a nunnery. Where's your father? Hmm. I mean, it's a sort of it's a car crash moment. And 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 it's already a joke. Where's your father is a joke in, in Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? When the nurse comes back and goes, your lover says like an honest man and a true, where's your mother? And Juliet goes, what do, you, what do you mean he says, where's my mother? So there's sort of this moment where it goes, what? Where's your father? Well, you've got to work out why Hamlet suddenly goes, hold on, where is your father? I mean, it seems to me, I don't think Ophelia is let out very often on her own to wander around the castle. You know, her father Polonius is a man who sends spies to look after his, look at his son at university. I and mean, this is not a man who's going to let a young woman walk alone around the castle. So there's this moment where Hamlet goes, is this a setup? So will you ask Sarah the question again? Yeah. Where is your father? At home, my lord. Good. 
So I think that's a really interesting moment because Ophelia knows that Polonius is behind the curtain with Claudius. So she lies to him. Right. Mm -hmm. At which point my sympathy level for Ophelia disappears. And, and, and I think there's something very odd. I have a, a current obsession, which I can't remember if I talked about in Phoenix, but I call conjoined letters. And this is a really good example of it. So, for example, Romeo describing Juliet says two of the fairest stars in all the heavens, except he doesn't because fairest ends with an ST and stars begins with an ST. So it's actually two of the fairest stars in all the heavens. You've got to make both work. I would kill thee with much cherishing. There's a wonderful line in Cymbeline where Inogen is, is talking about the fact that the fact that she's not going to win the kingdom because her brothers have been found. She, in a, Cymbeline says, oh, Imogen, thou hast lost by this a kingdom. She says, no, my lord, I have got two worlds by it. Well, got and two both end and begin with a T and two and worlds both begin with a W-O. You've got to separate them out. So it's not at home, my lord. Where's your father? At home, my lord. There are two M's. Do you see what I mean? Home ends with it. So, so just give it, uh, Chase, ask the question again and really, really separate those M sounds out with the film you would use there. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Now, that was a very different delivery to the first one. Do you see what I mean? The first one, you were just lying. Where's your father? Well, he's at home, my lord. No, he's not. He's behind the curtain and you know that. But that time you said, at home, my lord. And something else was, can you see something else is going on there? Either it's she's dealing with the fact that she's lying to her ex-boyfriend or boyfriend, or what's the other possibility? At home, my lord. If you stretch it out, I think she's telling him. I think she's telling him this is not safe and, and that he's not at home my lord i mean you know if you've been this close as close as hamlet and ophelia have been i mean a claudius and, and polonius are behind the arrow so you could actually go at home my lord and they wouldn't see it but frankly you wouldn't want to stay in that production too long but i think at the moment if she turns to him and goes at home my lord hamlet is going to pick up what's going on on. Sarah, I just want to do something slightly different now with, with the rest of it. Could you just give me your next line? On the, I said we're on the second page now. Could you just give me your next line? Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. And your next line? Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. And your next line? Oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. And the last line and a half? Oh, woe is me. To so what what, what 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 what's suddenly happening? I'm every, realizing something. Well, every single line starts with an O. You haven't started a single line in the first half of the scene with an O, but every single one starts with an O after at home, my lord. Well, I mean, woe is me is a theatrical cliche by 1595, let alone 1603. Um, but, but you know, you have to ask yourself why. As I say, you know, if you've got to notice that every speech starts with an O and think what O is. I would argue, uh, and, and, and perfectly happy to disagree, but I would argue that O is inherently theatrical. You know, O for a muse of fire. O that this too, too solid flesh would run. And modern actors hate O's. You must have this the whole time in, in, in drama class. You know, you give a modern actor something that starts with O and they sort of try and make it sound like a sort of embarrassed cough <laughs> for a muse of fire, you know, um, because we don't like being theatrical because heaven forbid in a theatre one should in any way be theatrical. Um, but I would say that it's it's a it's a theatric. Oh, the heavenly powers! Of, oh, help him, you sweet heavens! Oh, what a noble mind is here at the throne. I think she's acting, and I think she's acting not for Hamlet. I think she's acting for the people, the invisible audience behind the curtain. And you look at what they say. Everything you say, Sarah, is about Hamlet going. He's mad. He's mad. He's mad. 
help him, you sweet heavens, heavenly powers, restore him. What a noble mind is here, a throne, blah, blah, blah. And you go on about that quite a lot, don't you? Um, and, and there's an awful lot of, of, of this that goes on. Everything he says about you, Chase, everything you say about her is, I don't love you, I don't love you, I don't love you. And everything she says is, he's mad, he's mad, he's mad. What are the two things you really, really need, Claudius and Polonius, to think? That Hamlet's mad and he doesn't love you. Do you see what I mean? Because that saves you. So I'm pointing, I'm pointing at where you are on the screen. It never works, does it? Because <laughs> it's just like, ah! Um, <laughs> during COVID, I was trying to actually direct on Zoom. I did. You probably have to try and do this too. It's just horrible, isn't it? Because you just, you have no idea where the sort of perspective is in the room. But it seems to me that what happens here is after at home, my lord, the scene changes. I mean, without question, the scene changes. Hamlet suddenly turns on her. Having been aggressive about himself, he suddenly goes, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry, blah, blah, blah. I mean, and he's really unpleasant to her. And she's, oh, my God, he's insane. Oh, my God, he's insane. Oh, my God, he's insane. Well, it seems to me that you, you, you I mean, even if you don't think Ophelia tells him, if you're playing Ophelia, you've got to ask yourself, why do I suddenly preface every single speech I make in the rest of this scene with the word, oh? Why do I go, oh, he's mad? Um, you know, where does that come from? Because it hasn't come from what's happened previously. He's not been mad in the first half of the scene. And you've not been mean and vicious about her. And and what it does, and I think what makes it interesting. So, so, so let's go from, I just want to see if you get, I mean, it's, it's hard when you're in three quarter shot. But see what difference that makes. Go from where's your father and know, and, and Chase, understand from her what she's saying when she says at home, my lord. I mean, you can, I mean, you know, you can do that. He's over there. I don't think you'd need to. Um, and I think it's more fun. But just to say, say have more fun with it. Go, go from where's your father. Where's your father? At home, my lord. Let the doors be shut upon him that he may play the fool nowhere but in his own house. Farewell. Oh, help him, you sweet heavens. If thou dost marry, I'll give thee this plague for thy dowry. Be thou as chaste as ice, as pure as snow that shall not escape calumny. Get thee to a nunnery. Go, farewell. Or if thou wilt needs marry, marry a fool, for wise men know well enough what monsters you make of them. To a nunnery, go, and quickly to, farewell. Oh, heavenly powers, restore him. I have heard of your painting, Sue. Well enough, God hath given you one face, and you make yourself another. You jig, you amble, you lisp, you nickname God's creatures, and make your wantonness your ignorance. Go to all, no more on it. It hath made me mad. I say, we will have no more marriages. Those that are married already, all but one shall live. The rest shall keep as they are to a nunnery. Go. Great. And what was lovely about that, and I'll come back to your monologue in a moment, Sarah. What was lovely about that is you both started smiling. Do you know what I mean? Because you were both doing, we're doing acting, acting. And you both started smiling. And if, you know, we, we can't do it, and we technically can't do it, and you need to be off book. But if you got up and started playing this, you're sort of playing off each other. Do you see what I mean? The first half of the scene is very much about Hamlet doing that to, 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 to Ophelia, and Ophelia going, I, 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 and not knowing Paul Push, you know, those, those drama games we play. But the second half, and just watching the two of you do it, you started to actually start playing off each other. And, and, and enjoying it. And of course, it gives you huge scope because to a nunnery go can mean go to a brothel in the ears of Polonius and Claudius. And from Hamlet can be, you really need to get out of here. Do you know what I mean? And farewell and all those things. So you can have moments of absolute tenderness, moments of real. And, and, and that's extra. I thought you did it beautifully, Chase, that those that are married already, all but one shall live. This is what I'm going to do. So go, you, you need to get out of here because I'm going to have to kill him. 
you know what I mean? So there's a huge difference between the sort of die you hateful woman scene that this is normally played and suddenly the two of them working together it to me it makes sense of the the, the scene in, in watching the mouse trap where where she doesn't say go away it also makes sense of you know i don't want to watch a misogynistic bully for four and a half hours go to his grave frankly you know i've got better ways of spending my time but if there's something to lose it's really really hard and I just want to just finish one of them and then, then, then say, it's, let me know what you think. But it's just that that last speech of yours, um, Sarah, just just how long we got? We got a few minutes. Just 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 the last speech. Oh, what a noble mind is here or thrown. The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mold of form the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth blasted with ecstasy. A woe is me to have seen what I have seen, see what I see. Great. And then what I would get my students to do or my actors to do is what I call the Shakespeare cardiogram, where you do a little graph of the temperature of the speech. So if it's 10 syllables, it's on the flat line in the middle. If it goes up, it goes up. If it goes down, it goes down. And, and you think about that. So, you know, if it goes to 12 or 13 syllables, you're trying to get more syllables in that it'll take. So your blood pressure is going like this. If it goes colder. So Hamlet in too, too solid. The first line he mentions his mother, it's a 15 syllable line. So his blood pressure is going through the roof. Do it on this. Every single line is 10 syllables apart from now see that jangle, my noble and most sovereign reason, which is 11. So whatever she's saying, she's saying it incredibly regularly. You'd expect if it was, oh my God, Hamlet's insane. What are we going to do about Hamlet? It would be doing this all over the place. It's dead regular. She is absolutely on top of her material. And I think that's a really interesting thing about Ophelia because she's much cleverer. And otherwise what you get, and I say this as, as, to, to all my actors, you know, I think if you're playing a female role in Shakespeare and you're playing it as a victim, you're playing it wrong. Um, it stops Ophelia being a victim. I mean, of course she's a victim, she dies, but she doesn't die until her boyfriend kills her father and is exiled to be murdered. You know. At this point, I think the two of them are working together. I think it makes Ophelia a much more interesting character and certainly a more interesting character to play than the sort of Victorian fainty girl um, that, that you normally get of sort of, you know, woe is me. Um, no one says woe is me. And she's much more, I think in this version, she's much more feisty. And if I was, you know, Sarah, if you're playing Ophelia, I would, I, you know, give them the option of fainty or feisty. I know which way I'd jump. Does it just what, what, tell, tell me what you think? Does this make sense? It it does. I mean, I have noticed all the O's and this kind of really dramatic kind of opening to these lines, but just the even looking beyond the the first and last line in this in her last phrasing, just kind of delineating all of these qualities that Hamlet has had and that she's seen in him that they're quite, quite down. So is it that he, they're down in the sense that he is kind of put down the mask of what all of these people, even the people who love him in Denmark believe him to be, or that she can see who he really is beneath all of these, I know not seems that he can't actually, I think he actually is better at seeming to be something than not, than he thinks he is at the opening of the play. I, I think that's absolutely right. I think, but I do think if if you're playing it for, you know, what she's saying is 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 that noble and sovereign reason like sweet bells jangle that you know he's gone mad, you know it's all about he was this but now he's that. Well, that's interesting if it's for you, but it's odd if it's for you. It's much more. I think it's much more interesting if it's for them, and you know, and I've. I've 
I've I've done I've I've, I've not directed the whole of Hamlet, but I've done this scene many times, and and, and it just. It's it's just the fun you can have with it if it's two young people taking on the manipulative old, seems to me much more interesting, um, and 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 you know I, I I and I don't mind. I mean, some I was working with some students recently, and someone just didn't buy into this at all, and I said that's absolutely fine. I don't mind that you don't buy into it. All I do mind is that you need to ask yourself why all the O's are there. You need to ask yourself why Hamlet's trying to prosify the first half of the scene. And you need to ask yourself why the scene seems to pivot. You know, there's a sort of volta on at home, my lord. It, it becomes a different scene in the second half. If you play the whole scene as the same scene, it seems to me you're playing one thing. And Shakespeare very rarely does that. And I think it's just really a question of making sure that you've done the reading the students have done the reading the students understand that it's not just sort of some arcane ritual that we have to go through it's actually shakespeare directing the play and 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 that's how it works um robert i think i've, I've, I've as always talked for far too long um and it's 40 minutes i just want to say you both read that so well and took the notes i gave so well so thank you so much i can't i can't imagine doing it with a better hamlet and ophelia that was great <laughs> thank you it was really nice I can't hear you, Robert. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Sarah. Chase, uh, no weak woe is me for this crowd. Uh, we're never going to read the nunnery scene again in the same fashion. I, uh, I, for one, am now going to be paying close attention to the prose and the verse, right? As, uh, as you point out, Nick. Thank you, director Nick Hutchison, and to our two players, Sarah Seal and Chase Adelsman. Well played and such a delight for this audience. Do expect to see more of these workshops in the weeks ahead. And until next week with the Virtue Podcast, let's keep the conversations going in schools, on the stage, in our communities around the country, even around the globe with the help of Nick. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. <laughs>